is called The Surprisingly Dramatic Role of Nutrition on Mental Health. Okay. I'm excited about this because I know there are so many benefits to eating fruits and vegetables that go even far beyond what we talk about. We know the simple ones, like you lose a lot of weight. Yes. Lower in calories, higher in fiber, you poop it out, <laughs> you get more energy because it's higher in natural sugars, it's easier for your body to break down, it's easier for your body to digest. So the simple things like more energy, lower weight, clearer skin because higher in water, like those are these are simple things to understand. Like most people I think generally get the idea you eat more fruits and vegetables, you're gonna lose weight, you're gonna feel better. But there's a lot of other things too that come from this. We know longevity, people live a lot longer if they eat fruits and vegetables, right? The blue zones, where do they eat fruits and vegetables? But people live a lot longer when they eat fruits and vegetables. So and we know they have an impact on a lot of our common food diseases, like heart disease and diabetes. Um, but what we don't know as much about some of these things like mental health or reproduction. Like those are things I think that are really interesting to learn about fruits and vegetables. I mean, after watching the miracle of childbirth, after watching the miracle of the human body, after watching Carolina be able to provide and feed our baby with no water, nothing. Carolina drinks a lot of water, but the baby just drinks breast milk. I mean, there are magical, 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 magical things out there that are so powerful, that are so incredible, that just come from natural foods, natural fruits and vegetables, our natural bodies. So we're gonna learn about this. This is gonna be really cool. I'm excited for you guys to watch this. Are you guys ready to watch it? Yum. <laughs> Frozen grapes, Gammy replying to Landlady Kathy. So we're gonna watch this video. It's about the mental health thing. So let me, let me lead into this really quickly. All right, if you're just watching on YouTube, we are about to watch a video about the impact of food on your mental health. This is gonna be really exciting. I'm excited for you to watch this and for us to watch this. Also, if you're just new here on YouTube, make sure to subscribe and like this video. And we're live on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Marley Ficalora every single day. That's twitch.tv slash Marley Ficalora. Now let's learn about the impact of, well, that's our cauliflower. Let's learn about the impact of food on our mental health. So here we go. In 1847, a physician by the name of Semmelweis advised that all physicians wash their hands before touching a pregnant woman in order to prevent childbed fever. His research showed that you could reduce the mortality rates from septicemia from 18% down to 2% simply through washing your hands with chlorinated lime. His medical colleagues refused to accept that they themselves were responsible for spreading infection. Semmelweis was ridiculed by his peers, dismissed, and the criticism and backlash broke him down, and he died in an asylum two weeks later from septicemia at the age of 47. What I am going to talk about today may sound as radical as hand-washing sounded to a mid-19th century doctor, and yet it is equally scientific. It is the simple idea that optimizing nutrition is a safe and viable way to avoid, treat, or lessen mental illness. Nutrition matters. Poor nutrition is a significant and modifiable risk factor for the development of mental illness. According to the 2000... All right, so we're learning a lot already right off the bat. I think that's cool that she talks about hand washing and the fact that that was seen as this crazy idea a long time ago. But I'm really excited to see what she says about nutrition. Obviously, she's making a connection right at the beginning of her speech is the TED talk. Again, it's called the surprisingly dramatic role of nutrition in mental health. I don't think it's super surprising. I think I would expect that it has an impact on your mental health, but we're going to learn a lot about that. Um, but she's, she's making this connection saying nutrition in terms of poor nutrition leads to a lot of mental health disorders. So let's see what she says. 2013 New Zealand Health Survey, the rates of psychiatric illnesses in children doubled over the last five years. Internationally, there's been a three-fold increase in ADHD, a 20-fold increase in autism, and a 40-fold increase in bipolar disorder in children. And this graph... I will say, I've been noticing this as well, there has been a massive uptick in a lot of these diseases. And I think part of it 
is to do with the fact that we now know what these diseases are, so we're able to diagnose them. But what she said is it's astounding, the numbers, how much ADHD, autism, and some of these disorders have increased in just a few years, really. Here shows there's been a four-fold increase in the rates of the number of people who are on disability as a direct consequence of an underlying psychiatric illness. The rates of mental illness are on the rise. So how are we dealing with this problem? Currently, our healthcare system operates within a medical model. Now this means that you would typically be offered psychiatric medications first, followed by psychological therapies and other forms of support. Our reliance on medications as a frontline form of treatment is evident from the increasing rates of prescriptions. For example, in 2012, half a million New Zealanders, that's one-eighth of us, had been prescribed an anti- Okay, I was wondering when I saw that other graph, it was New Zealand, and I was wondering, did she just pick a New Zealand uh, study? But now we know that they're in New Zealand, so that's good to know. Depressant, that's 38% higher than five years previously. Similarly, the rates of prescriptions for antipsychotics doubled from 2006 to 2011. Given that this medical model is fairly universal across all Western societies, you would rightfully expect that it was working well. And indeed, in some cases, these treatments save lives. And I'm not here to dismiss it altogether. However, if a treatment is truly effective, then shouldn't the rates of disorder and disability as a direct consequence of that illness be decreasing rather than increasing? And that's why we need to consider the role that medications might be playing in some of these outcomes. If we take any class of medication, antipsychotics, anti-anxiety medications, antidepressants, the pattern is the same. In the short term, these treatments are often very effective, but in the long term, they aren't. And in some cases, they're making life worse. If we look at, for example, studies on, that have been done on ADHD children treated with stimulants or Ritalin, in the short term, they are better and responding, than, better responders than any other form of treatment. But in the long term, I'll say something about this short-term versus long-term type thing. Because we have seen such drastic shifts in modern medicine over the course of the last 20 to 30 years, and we've seen so many new drugs, so many new diagnoses, so many rises in diseases, there's a lot of short-term studies, two, five, 10 years, but not a lot of long-term studies. And that's important when you're putting a kid on ADHD or you're putting a kid on these, some of these medications and they're six, seven years old, what happens after 20 years of being on this medication? What happens after 30 years of being on this medication? I've thought about that a lot. And I'm not saying that these medications aren't super important. She's saying, look, there's huge benefits to the people in the first couple of years. Some of these, it's like life or death if you don't take these medications. But I just think we, it's kind of hard. It's like being in a beta. I don't know if you guys know about betas, but a beta is like the first people that test something out. Because they know it's not perfect, they know it's not ready, they know there's gonna be things that are broken and not gonna work, so they do a beta. But the problem is, is during that beta, problems occur and they have to figure those out before it goes to the mass market. And so I feel like we're kind of living in a society of drugs being betas, so let's look. They fare less well than children who were never prescribed these medications. Another study showed that Despite our ever-increasing reliance on antidepressants, the recovery rates and relapse rates are no better now than they were 50 years ago prior to the advent of these medications. And children with depression who are treated with antidepressants are three times more likely to convert to bipolar disorder than children who were never given these medications. And people who are randomized to stay on their dose of antipsychotic medications are less likely to recover from schizophrenia in the long term than people who had been randomized to a dose reduction or complete elimination of the drug. And I can show you more and more studies all highlighting 
this same bleak picture. So, pretty depressing. <laughs> Is there another way forward? Almost two decades ago, my PhD supervisor at the time, Professor Bonnie Kaplan, told me about some families who were treating themselves with nutrients in southern Alberta, Canada. Now, they had bipolar disorder, psychosis, um, depression. These are serious conditions, and my education in, in clinical psychology had taught me that nutrition and diet were of trivial significance for mental health, and that only drugs or psychotherapy could treat these serious conditions. But she and others were publishing uh, preliminary data in the earlier part of the century showing people getting well and staying well. And so I decided to study the nutrients, and that's what I've done for the last decades. In 2009, I received some funding to run a randomized placebo-controlled trial using my minerals and vitamins, also known collectively as micronutrients, for the treatment of ADHD in adults. This is pretty cool because I'm so glad she got funding because we need more studies about this, about natural ways to help prevent things or to heal things because there are so many, like a lot of the older medicines from a long, long time ago before we had this, you know, modern revolution and all this scientific, you know, um, all this modernization, all this technology, we used a lot of like herbs, a lot of like the old remedies were like crushed up herbs. And so for her to get into the micronutrients and see their impact on someone's ADHD. This is huge because I think a lot of people are suffering from this now, um, especially with like all of our TVs and all of our iPhones and all of our computers. It's just like this constant stimulation. So being able to treat this is really important. So I'm excited to see what she says after getting funding. And this study was published in the British Journal of Psychiatry in April of this year. And here's what we found. Within just an eight week period, twice as many people responded in the micronutrient group compared to placebo. Twice as many people went into remission in their depression in the micronutrient group. Hyperactivity and impulsivity reduced into the normal non-clinical range. And those who were taking the micronutrients were more likely to report that their ADHD symptoms were less impairing and less interfering than uh, in their work and social relationships than people who were on the placebo. And one year later, those people who stayed on the micronutrients maintained their changes or showed further improvement, and those who, were, um, who switched or, to medications or stopped the micronutrients actually showed a worsening of their symptoms. Now, I need to tell you something here, and that is when I say micronutrients, I'm actually referring to a dose higher than what you get out of a vitamin pill purchased in the supermarket. We, in this study, we gave participants up to 15 pills a day with 36 nutrients. So it would be unlikely that if you went and got an over-the-counter supplement, you would unlikely see these positive benefits, both because the dose is lower and the breadth of nutrients is lower. Now, these, uh, these positive benefits have not, are not confined to a single study. My lab at the University of Canterbury is the Mental Health and Nutrition Research Group, and we've published over 20 papers in medical journals, all documenting the benefits of micronutrients. For example, this study here showed that we could reduce the symptoms of bipolar disorder in children by 50% with a simultaneous reduction in medi medication. These are huge numbers. I mean, we're talking about 50% bipolar, 50% ADHD, we're doing twice as better. Like, this is some serious numbers um, that, that twice as, uh, doing twice as well as the placebo. This is, this is incredible. And she said not getting enough micronutrients from a pill. I'd love to know about the micronutrients from fruits and vegetables. I do talk about this a lot, not the mental health, but talk about calories and spending them like money. When you spend money, you usually wanna get as much as you can for as little money as you possibly can spend. When you spend calories, you wanna get, cause you're still gonna eat, need to eat a certain amount of calories in order to function, in order to be, have energy, get through the day, be active, especially if you're super physically active and you play sports or, you're, or you exercise, you need to eat a certain amount of calories. So what does that mean? Because not all calories are treated equally or created equally. If you eat super high micronutrient foods, which is like what we just ate, that orange, it's gonna have tons of micronutrients, but it's extremely low in calories. So we're paying like nothing for lots of micronutrients. If you eat a huge salad and you don't eat oil, what you're getting is tons of micronutrients at a very low cost in calories. 
pounds. So you're going to lose the weight, which we know gives you all sorts of benefits in terms of physical and health benefits. Um, but now we're learning that micronutrients play a huge part of mental health. So it's really important, like I said, to think about where you're spending your calories. Because it's so easy to take a tablespoon of oil is 120 calories and not many micronutrients, if, if almost none. So you got to understand you want to put the highest number of micronutrients in your body at the lowest number of calories. You still want to have enough calories that you function and you should eat enough for your, for your lifestyle so that you're healthy and you're happy. But you have to think about quality over quantity. You have to think about spending your calories wisely. And that's like I just said, snack on fruits. Look at the calories of chips versus the calories of bananas or of oranges or of apples or of cherries. Think about the number of micronutrients you can get from fruit versus the micronutrients you can get from chips. If you trade that snack, you're gonna do a lot of good for yourself and obviously for your mental health as well, but let's keep watching. This study here showed that we could reduce rates of probable post-traumatic stress disorder from 65% down to 18% following the Christchurch earthquakes with a one month intervention of micronutrients with no change in those not taking the nutrients. Even one year later, those people who had received the nutrients were doing better than those who didn't. And we've just replicated these findings in collaboration with researchers at the University of Calgary following the floods of June 2013 in Alberta, Canada. To me, the message is clear that a well-nourished body and brain is better able to withstand ongoing stress and recover from illness. Giving micronutrients in appropriate doses can be an effective and inexpensive public health intervention to improve the mental health of a population following an environmental catastrophe. You know what I'm thinking? Wow, what a, if, if what she's saying is true, and she's got the studies and they have the funding to do these scientific studies, and, the, and I'm you know, tending to believe what she's saying because she's doing it from a scientific perspective. But if she's saying what she's saying is true, then that's great after earthquakes, but think about our military, our Navy, our Army. Um, if we could give them healthier food, I know that they, they eat healthier because they have a lot of exercise and a lot of stuff that they do, but, but in general, when you think about army food, you don't think about like salads and fruits and vegetables. But if we were to do really healthy, really fresh, you know, real food, non-processed food for our military, maybe there'd be less incidence of PTSD. I don't know, and that's what her study is saying for people after earthquakes, but where else can we apply this? We know the benefits of fruits and vegetables for your heart, for diabetes, but now we're learning about it for your, and again, it's the micronutrients she's talking about, but where do micronutrients come from? So. In my 20 year career, I have rarely seen these dramatic responses from conventional treatments. When people get well, they get well across the board, not only in the symptoms that we treated, but also in other areas like improved sleep, stabilization of mood, reduction in anxiety, and the reduction in need for cigarettes, cannabis, and alcohol. My research and those around the world have shown. I will say that I stopped drinking when I was doing the Pro Second Challenge. I don't drink at all. I drink no alcohol, so maybe that's why. That 60 to 80% of people respond to micronutrients, showing just how powerful this intervention is. And internationally, uh, there have now been 20 randomized placebo controlled trials. This is the gold standard that we use to make clinical decisions, showing that we can reduce aggression in prisoners, slow cognitive decline in the elderly, treat depression, anxiety, stress, autism, and ADHD. And they might even be more cost effective than current conventional treatments. This study here documented the treatment of a 10-year-old boy with psychosis. When his six-month inpatient treatment with medications was unsuccessful, he was treated with micronutrients. Not only did he, the micronutrients completely eliminate his hallucinations and delusions, cha changes that were maintained six years later, but the cost of the treatment was less than 2% than the cost of the unsuccessful inpatient treatment. The cost savings alone 
make it imperative that our society pay attention to the wider benefits of this approach. And there is more good news. Treating, supplementing before mental illness emerges can actually stop these problems from developing in the first place. This fantastic study looked at 81 adolescents at risk for psychosis and randomized them to receive either omega-3 fatty acids in the form of fish oils, essential nutrients for brain health, or placebo for a 12-week period. One year later, 5% of those who received the fish oil had converted to psychosis versus 28% of those on placebo. That represents an 80% reduction in the chances of you getting converting to psychosis simply through giving fish oils. I wonder if I know what some of you are thinking. I wonder if some of you are thinking, hold on, why don't I just eat better? Why don't I just tell everyone to eat better? And indeed, there are some fantastic studies that document the strong relationship between dietary patterns and mental health, although this is a, we're still in very early days of scientific investigation. We don't know who would benefit from dietary manipulation alone and who may need the additional boost from extra nutrients. But even in the last five years, there have been 11 epidemiological studies cross-sectionally and around the, um, and, and longitudinally in large populations around the world all showing the same thing. The more you eat a prudent or Mediterranean or uh, unprocessed type of diet, the lower your risk for depression. So now just get into the diet part. That's the part we obviously care about because we all eat fruits and vegetables and we all care about that. When people say Mediterranean diet, they're mainly saying, like she's saying, unprocessed. Um, the Mediterranean diet's like a lot of, like you think about chickpeas, like lentils, um, lemons and fruits and olives and those sorts of things, but it's unprocessed fruits and vegetables. That's the majority of it. There is fish in the Mediterranean diet as well, and she talked about fish oil. Um, you can eat, if you're a vegan, you can eat, which I don't eat fish. I've never eaten fish in my life. Um, you can eat kelp or you can eat seaweed or you can eat... There's plenty of other ways you can get um, the benefits of that without having to eat fish, but let's keep watching. And the more you eat the Western diet or processed food, the higher your risk. I'll say something. Just look at just look at these pictures. Like that is the Western diet, and just looking at it, you can just tell. I mean, the top left is fish, but the but if you look at the fruit and vegetables, and you look at the the Western diet, and you can just tell what you're supposed to eat and you're not supposed to eat, even if you're just, just, just looking at them. If you just gave this two pictures, if you put this donut picture and hamburgers, it looks like, uh, and if you put that next to that picture of this broccoli, leek, potatoes, carrots, squash, um, and you put those two next to each other, I would guarantee you 99% of people would say the colorful one looks more beautiful. And that's really what we should be eating. And it's showing, look, it's showing decreased depression versus increased depression if you eat the, the processed. For depression. I know of only one study that has not found this association and not a single study shows that the Western diet is good for our mental health. <laughs> what is the Western diet? Well, it's one that is heavily processed high in refined grains, sugary drinks, takeaways, and low in fresh produce. And the healthy diet is one that is fresh, high in fruits and vegetables, high in fish, nuts, healthy fats, and low in processed foods. What your grandmother would recognize as food. <laughs> there are still many questions remaining about- It is kind of crazy when you think about it, like that last point, like obviously fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds. All the things that we talk about, legumes, all very, very important. Um, that's what we eat. And But it is interesting when she shows your grandmother, that's the part that hit home for me because it is interesting when you go to the grocery store, being at the grocery store for as many times as I've been, I mean, we did 840 straight days of being at the grocery store every single day all over the country in the produce section. People who are older, I'd say generally over 80 years old, have more fruits in veg and vegetables in their baskets than people who are younger, 30 years and younger. 
the more majority of people that are 30 years and younger have Doritos and Cheetos and Snickers and Oreos and frozen dinners and all that sort of stuff. The people that are 80 and older, they'll have some yogurt, but the majority of their cart is blueberries and blackberries and apples and bananas. And it is interesting. It's like, did these eating habits allow this person to achieve the age of 90 at the grocery store or the age of 80? What allowed this person to achieve this longevity? And they say the food that our grandmother or our grandfather saw as real food because it is food. The other stuff is not food. It was made in the laboratory and is very recent. Only since, you know, supermarkets came out. All this stuff is very recent. That's the other thing that most people don't understand is we haven't had very much time to even study the negative impacts of the Western diet or of the new diet or the processed food. There's some of the processed foods that hit the shelves. They don't have to go through any clinical trials. It's not like a drug that has to go through years of randomized trials. They have to publish their results. They have to be scrutinized by the FDA. They have to get passed. You can make anyone right now watching this video or anyone in the world can make a food. They can name it whatever they want to name it and they can get it passed. Yes, before it goes on supermarket shelves, they'll have to get passed by the FDA. But for the, for the majority of fruits and vegetables, I mean, for most of the snacks you can sell on the internet direct to consumers, you can make whatever you want. And there's no studies to show the impact of what it has on people's health, even though it's going into their bodies because people are eating it. And even with that being said, some of these supermarket foods, they've only been around for like five years. So how do we know what the impact on people's health, health is? We just don't. We don't even know it yet. We know that heart disease is the highest it's ever been. We know diabetes is skyrocketing as the highest it's ever been. We know people are on more medications than they've ever been on before. We know people are dying younger now than they used to die. So we know that we're starting to really start to feel these effects. People are dying of heart attacks. Over half a million people die of heart attacks, a disease that is preventable. So you're talking about over a half of a million, we're talking about 650, 675,000 people dying from a disease that doesn't have to happen. So there's a lot of these things, it's like what I talked about, like even like these medications she's talking about, you know, short term they have great benefits, but long term we don't know enough about them, or long term you're starting to see these people actually have negative results from taking these same medications that were supposed to help them with the disease that they're currently fighting or battling. So it's the same thing applies to food. She says, Grandma, look, it's not very many generations of put off. One, two generations off from the difference between people all eating unprocessed food to people all eating processed food. This is very short, very short amount of time to study the impact of this super highly processed food. And we're seeing the, we're seeing the problems that are occurring. Everyone knows someone that has died from a heart attack or a stroke. Everyone knows someone that's diabetic. So it's just something to think about. About the relationship between mental health and nutrition. What role do genetics play in determining who's going to respond to nutrients and who needs additional nutrients and they can get out of their diet? What role does an infected, inflamed gut play in the absorption of nutrients? It's not we are what we eat, it's what we are what we absorb. And what role do medications play in determining how effective the nutrients are? Combining medications and nutrients is actually complicated, and we need more research and better understanding these interactions. But ultimately, we need to know how long these good benefits last. So with all of this data, this rich data, highlighting the power of nutrition, I think we can make some individual and collective changes now. We could reconsider our current treatment approach, prioritize lifestyle factors, healthy eating, exercise, supplements when necessary, psychological treatments, and save medications. I definitely think that exercise makes a massive impact on mental health. I'll just say that. Every time I'm exercising, it definitely clears my mind a lot. I don't know how many of you guys, you can throw it in the chat, how many of you guys just experience even walking or even being on the beach, the impact of being outside has on your mental health. For when these approaches don't work, if nutrients work, then shouldn't they be covered through our healthcare system? Take universal prevention seriously by optimizing. It would be so cool if some of these major healthcare providers started to give us either 50% off or free fruits and vegetables. Like, how cool would that be if you're covered? 
you get free fruits and vegetables. I mean, if you think about it from the healthcare providers, they're gonna get a huge return because people aren't gonna be sick as much and people will benefit because they won't have to worry about their food budgets and, and being able to eat. So I think it's a great idea. Why not have some of the major healthcare providers in the United States at least offer either free or steeply discounted fruits and vegetables? I think that'd be awesome. In the nutrition of those who are vulnerable. We don't wait for the heart attack to hit in order for us to modify lifestyle behaviors that we know contribute to heart disease. It should be no different with mental health. An easy way to implement universal prevention would be to have pregnant women, not pregnant women, midwives, tell pregnant women about the importance of nutrition. Nutrient-depleted mothers produce nutrient-depleted children. Nutrient-poor foods during pregnancy increase the chances that your child will have a mental health problem. Learn about the risks of cheap processed foods. As Michael Pollan stated, cheap food is an illusion. There is no such thing as cheap food. The price is paid somewhere, and if it's not paid at the cash register, then it's charged to the environment and to the public purse in the form of subsidies, and it's charged to your health. All children need to learn how to cook. All children need to know that food doesn't have to come in a packet. Schools could reflect on the content of their lunch menus. Children are too frequently rewarded. Okay, I read. I've never watched this video, I don't know who she is, but Julia Rucklidge, I gotta say I'm really liking what she's saying. Um, this starting to hammer them. She's talking about the schools, and we talked about the schools. The lunch program is literally a fast food menu. She's talking about heart disease, she's talking about a lot of these really important things that, you know, things food doesn't need to be processed. Food can be real. And I'm liking it, I'm liking what she's saying. With processed foods for good behavior, we need to reflect on whether or not this pairing intuitively makes sense. Ultimately, we have a responsibility to teach them that every time they put something in their mouths, they make a choice to eat something nourishing or something nutritionally depleted. In the 19th century, physicians were offended when Semmelweis suggested they wash their hands before delivering babies. We are now asking them to consider whether the Medications that they prescribe are contributing to the poor long-term outcome for some people with mental illness. But eating well and when appropriate, additional nutrients can improve the mental health of many people. I leave you with one last thought. Randomized trials in the 1600s showed that putting lines aboard ships headed out for long voyages completely eliminated the 40% mortality from scurvy, but it took 264 years for the British government to mandate that all ships must carry citrus for their sailors. How long will it take our society to pay attention to the research showing that suboptimal nutrition is contributing to the epidemic of mental illness? So this is my idea worth spreading. Nutrition matters. And if we're really ready to get serious about mental health, we need to get serious about the critical role played by nutrition. Thank you. I loved what she said at the end. That was cool. Oh, let me pull you guys back. Um, what did you guys think? Whoever still left, what did you guys think? I thought that that was really interesting. Um, I, we know that there's tons of benefits from eating healthy. Now we know more about the mental health benefits. She's getting a lot of funding, she's doing a lot of studying. Um, and it's amazing how she said what she said about the ships, the limes, the citrus, the scurvy. It takes 260 years for them to, to change. And it just takes so much time, even though we know the science is there, we know that this is making a difference. Still, conventional wisdom is really hard to change. It's really hard to change people's ways when they're set in them. And so that's really tricky. Let's see what you guys said. That was very interesting, right? How crazy is that? So interesting. Um, there's a huge difference between the days I can get outside and walk dogs and the days I need to stay in due to weather. Yeah, getting outside makes a major difference. Here's my thought really quickly. I believe that simple things make the biggest difference. And what does that mean? I think a lot of our current diseases and a lot of things that we're fighting right now, if you just take away all of the complexities that we've created throughout the course of our human history, and you just go back to the simple, sim simple ways. 
you eat fruits, you eat vegetables, they come already packaged in their little, their little peels. If you eat the simple things, oranges and apples, they grow on the trees and you eat them, and you eat the, the vegetables, they grow on the ground. If you just break it down and go simple, not the advertising, the packaging, the science that gone into it, if you just go back to the basics, spending time outside, being barefoot on the grass, doing things that now like there's a lot of studies that show like being barefoot on soil makes a huge difference in your health. Being in the sun makes a huge difference in your health. If you just do the things we would have naturally done before we've had this massive industrial revolution, you will reap the benefits. I truly, genuinely believe that. Simple. If you live a simpler life, if you eat simpler, if you live simpler, you will live longer and live better. I really liked it. Thank you, Kimberly. All right. Um, so that was a cool video. I hope that helps. I think that is really, 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 really important um, for people to know that this has so many impacts on you in so many different ways. And we'll look back on this. I promise you we'll look back on this. And we'll be like, why did we not eat only fruits and vegetables? 